Hello, and welcome to this Automation Summit session, where we are going to dive into the wild world of mutability, declarability, and disposability. Oh my. So as a longtime attendee, but first time presenter, I figured it might be helpful to give a little bit of an introduction about myself. So my name is Kyle Ruddy. I'm probably most well known in certain uh, various communities through some of the efforts that I've done on the technical marketing side for some of the various companies where I've had the um, absolute luck to be able to focus in on automation. However, outside of that, I'm a huge prescriber to the concept of iron sharpens iron. Uh, so I love doing events like these, um, attending user groups and, and, you know, just the general sharing of information, because I think that's helped my career out tremendously. Uh, so some of the ways that, that you can get in contact or see some of the stuff that I've written, um, you know, if it's in paragraph form, it's on my blog. If it's code based, it's in GitHub. If it's demo based, it's events like these um, or with the good folks at the V Brown Bag crew. Uh, Twitter is probably the easiest way to reach me. And throughout all those different items, KM Ruddy is generally my username. So diving right into the uh, to the concept, the idea, the discussion at hand. Uh, really, what I want to go back to is is back to 2002, uh, where there was a paper that was created and presented uh, at the 16th Systems Administration Conference uh, by Steve Tragow and Lance Brown. Uh, and it really focused in on those three big words that I started off this session with. Uh, but really, it's, it's all about infrastructure management um, and, and really how to do that in the best way possible. Uh, and, and so part of what their paper described, I'll, I'll read off a blurb here real quick, uh, and, and it's really the least cost way to ensure that the behavior of any two hosts will remain completely identical is always to implement the same changes in the same order on both hosts. Now, this is one of those things, especially if you've been in the system administration, server administration uh, side of things for a while, like that, that concept seems pretty basic. And for the most part, it is. However, the, the actual capabilities for a lot of places to be able to continue to do that and have identical systems going through uh, in the way that things have been managed is extremely hard. Uh, and, and it's very unique if you get into those situations where you know several different servers are being managed by several different people and you still end up with that same result. And that's really what we're here to talk about and focus in on, on some of these different ways that we can manage servers uh, and, you know, how things have kind of evolved over the past couple of years. So we're actually going to start off with a really cool concept. Um, I, I greatly enjoy whiteboarding. Uh, I may not be the best at it, but I do think it proves out a lot of these use cases very effectively. So give me one second to switch over to our to my whiteboard that I'm using uh, for this session. Okay, so hopefully we have our, our whiteboard up here on the screen and we're all set and ready to go. So this is what something th this is what something that uh, that not a lot of places actually get the capability of doing, and, and that's starting with a blank slate. Uh, but what we're going to be doing is taking a look at a uh, an application server that's being set up and kind of how we manage that, uh, how we've managed that in the past, and how we kind of manage it, uh, or how we can manage it going forward. So there's a concept of a couple different kind of theories that, that starts off uh, when we manage these systems. So we we have those those items that start off, you know, the day zero uh, stuff. You know, this is where we're you know building out the applications that are supposed to be running on that, or building out golden templates, uh, things of that nature before we actually get to the deployment phase, uh, because that is generally built in around day one. You know, that's the, the deployment phase, that's the setup phase, that's the, you know, getting it ready to, to be accessed or, or to serve up web pages in, in this particular use case. Then we get into day two or, or day two plus, because that's kind of the, the care and management, uh, the, the feeding, if you will, uh, for these particular servers or, or even the services that live on the servers themselves. Uh, so here we're going to, uh, and we have a nice progression here, you know, in your, your own general um, use cases and environments, you, you probably follow this, this kind of fairly 
prescriptively, though you may only be involved in one particular area. So let's take this from kind of a, whole, a holistic, uh, wide level view here. So here we are, we're going to have a we're going to take a look at the the imperative uh, or the mutable way that we can manage some of the parts of these of this uh, of this server. So what we're going to start off by doing is we're going to uh, talk with the app team, and what the app team is going to do is they are going to be creating the applications or the services that are going to be running uh, on top of these or particular uh, a set of servers maybe. So there's our there's our application code uh, that, that's living out there and, and that's going to do all the work uh, that we need to be able to make use of and, and access. So then now that we have that kind of situation figured out, we know what the server is going to run. Now we get into the deploy phase. Now the deploy team you know, in, in some environments, this might be a dedicated team. In other environments, it might be the operations team. It, it generally just depends on, on the scale and how that uh, organization is focusing in on their deployment of, of their different workloads. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and, and deploy our virtual machine. Now, in some cases, you have a pipeline process that goes through and builds out golden images that might be as up to date as possible, uh, but generally every one of these virtual machines are going to have some sort of operating system that's on there uh, and probably going to have some policies that uh, that need to be applied to it, either in the form of patches and security things that, that go to the operating system itself or something that's organization based uh, where you, you have some security policies or rules, group policy, things of that nature. So then once we have our virtual machine deployed, uh, we're still going in in day one here, but now we really get into the ops team uh, where they're going to, going to be a whole lot more involved because now it's time to get that stuff installed that our application team created on day zero. So what we're going to be doing here is we have a uh, an application. This is going to be, let's say, version 1.0. And we're going to have that same uh, 1.0 code for our web server as well as our database. So we're standing up a three-tier architecture uh, for this particular server, and it's all going to live on that one virtual machine. So cool, day one, done. Uh, all of our users can, can start accessing it, using it, consuming it, doing all of those fun things. However, if we fast forward down the road a little bit, now we're getting to the point where, you know, maybe the application code has changed a little bit. Maybe there are some operating system patches that, that need to be applied, things of that nature. So now we have to go back for some of those day two activities. So now maybe we have our deploy team or operations team, depending on, you know, again, the organization. Uh, we've got to go through on and do some patching. So we've applied some operating system patches. So we're, we're slightly tweaking the system. Uh, then we also have to do the same thing. We need to update some of those uh, different uh, application or, you know, says the services that are running out there. So maybe we have our, our application is updated to maybe 2.0. Then we have our, our web server. Uh, that's hmm, maybe we don't have any updates there. So that stays and remains at 1.0. But our database has an incremental change. Uh, so that's going to go ahead and be updated to version 1.5. Uh, and, and so, you know, this is one of those things where, where we kind of continue to to progress um, as time goes on. Uh, and like, this is already a little complex just for, for the one virtual machine. But think about this if you, you have a bunch of these that are behind load balancers. You know, think about one, two, then think about 10, think about 100. And then in certain cases, you know, think about how long this, this could continue to go on, uh, you know, in, in just this kind of repeated fashion uh, of, of just cycling through, you know, at, at what point do you get to the end of the life cycle uh, of this particular virtual machine? You know, a lot of folks, a lot of organizations may not already have that documented. So this thing could live forever. But let's take a look at this from, so this was the, the mutable method of, of kind of the approach to the life cycle of a particular workload. So let's take a look at this from the other side of this, where we get into the immutable uh, style of management that's there. So let me scroll back into our 
our area here. So we're still going to have our, our application team. Uh, they're going to go ahead and, you know, they still have an application to write. Uh, so they're, they're still going to continue to do that. Nothing's going to change from, from that particular aspect. Still have our application. Now, the interesting thing is that this can all now change as well to include another team. So this is where kind of our, maybe our DevOps team, um, or, you know, maybe it's a different, uh, different team, either developers or uh, DevOps, or maybe if it's, it's even the, the operations team, you know. So they're going to have their own code now to write uh, for, you know, however it's, it's going to look like to deploy this particular workload, virtual machine, if you will, uh, to get to that end result. So then at that point, we get back into our day one uh, mentality where it, it's time to make this workload happen. You know, toss this out there into the world, bring it to life. Uh, so again, we're, we're still going to have that, that operating system, we're still going to have that virtual machine, still going to have those policies. Uh, th this could change because this this could be the um, including a, a different type of pipeline in the way that that this works. You know, they could go from nothing to to end result as part of that pipeline, depending on on you know what kind of code our our DevOps team was creating and writing there. Uh, then it's also going to have our our uh, our application information was also defined for not just our, our virtual machine there, but also for how to deploy our, our application so that we can get our, sorry, it's changed our font there, or our font color. So we still have our, our application, you know, that's still going to continue to be 1.0. We're gonna keep with that, that same mentality there. We're still gonna have our, our web server that's out there and we're still gonna have our database server However, now instead of you know doing it either by hand or by script, we're now going to use um, a, a notion of infrastructure as code uh, that we'll get to here in just a second. Uh, but but the end goal here is is that we have code that does the deployment of this uh, particular infrastructure. So then, when it's time to go through and, and get to these day two activities, there's a bit of a change. You know, so instead of having to go through and and touch this virtual machine and apply patches and apply updates and things of that nature, uh, what actually happens is, is in most of these environments, you actually have the, the ability uh, to go ahead and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll cancel out this one and we'll go ahead and stand up another set of code. And now this set of code will go ahead and deploy our updated workload. So we still have our, our virtual machine, we still have our OS, still have our policies. However, now, like even though the, the, the OS and policies already have the patches, you, you know, maybe not too big of a deal, but really the big deal comes into play when our application tier uh, is updated there. So we can get into our uh, application is going to be, you know, 2.0. Our web server is still going to be 1.0 then our database can continue to be 1.5. 1, 1 now, so at this point, we have the ability to go through and test things to make sure that this is going to be compliant, everything is gonna work uh, and, and go forth. And assuming that everything is good, you know, all we have to do is go back through here, cancel that out, and we move all the workload over to our, our new virtual machine that's there. So we never actually reach day two. Because if anything happens, we we redeploy. We never have to go through the the problem of of intricately troubleshooting a live production system or having to worry about uh, you know taking live production systems out of production where customers and and other folks can actually use them. Uh, so it's a it's a little bit of a different. It's a change in the way that we operate. It's a change in the way that we understand our infrastructure, and it's definitely a change in the way that we manage our infrastructure. So with that, let's dive right back into our slide deck.
All right, so now that we hopefully have a, a pretty good understanding of what it means when we talk about the difference between mutable or changing infrastructure and immutable or generally unchanging infrastructure, let's talk about it from a different perspective. And, you know, how do we build these things? Uh, you know, we talk about the, the difference between imperative and declarative. So one of my favorite activities is Lego building. So let's take the same concept uh, around building Legos and kind of apply it to our infrastructure now as well. So for our first example of using an imperative uh, method of say building a race car, you know, when we think about this, it's really going to be instructions. So this is, you know, you open up the box, you take out the instructions and you go step by step by step going all the way through uh, I, don't, I don't know, this one was like 25, 26 different steps to get to that end result of building that race car. So all along the way, you learned all the intricate piece, parts and pieces of building the race car. So, you know, you have a really great fundamental understanding of what makes a race car. But on the other side, if we change over to the more declarative approach and we still want to build that race car, instead of having to go through the process and, uh, you know, having that understanding of, you know, what comprises a race car, we just take advantage of, of, you know, either another service or a system and just tell it, you know, hey, build us a race car. You know, right off the bat, that sounds amazing. That sounds like a really good thing. And, and it's a really easy transition to, to, you know, just go over and build this thing. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you, you may not get what you actually intended. Uh, so, you know, for all the F1 fans that are out there, you know, instead of that Ferrari that we wanted, we we accidentally ended up with a, a Mercedes. Uh, now, is it still a race car? Absolutely. Because, you know, we we told it, we told the system that, you know, we described that we wanted a race car and it delivered, but it wasn't quite what we wanted. So what happens if we want to, say, build a red race car? You know, we want that same race car that we had from the imperative step. So now we just tell it, you know, we, we give it that additional information, that additional context or metadata that can kind of build out or, or allow the system to build out a red race car. So then in the end, we do get our, our Ferrari that's there, that's, that's part of our, our Lego race team. Now, again, these are kind of very simplistic uh, approach to the difference between imperative and, and declarative. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things where it's, you know, you, you kind of pivot your idea, your your concept, the way that you apply the things to the environment uh, as you know it and the things that you're managing, uh, because in, instead of having to, you know, have those, you know, very intricate, detailed, fundamental understandings of the service that you're interacting with, uh, you, you kind of get to focus in on the things that bring value, uh, what those end results actually are, so that I don't have to worry about the, you know, million steps that are involved in creating this Lego bridge set. Uh, I just know that, you know, that's what I want in the end. That's what's going to bring value to the business. Uh, and, and it really helps to enable uh, ourselves and the way that we manage our infrastructure uh, when it comes to that type of nature. So moving along here, let's talk about infrastructure as code. Uh, because this is definitely something that that ends up turning into uh, a really big discussion because there there are several types um and, and this is especially true when we when we think about the different products that are out there and tools that we can interact with uh, so first let's start off with our types uh, so first and foremost the biggest one out there that is probably the this the con concept of provisioning so this is the way that that you you know you create or you describe what you want your infrastructure or those objects to look like. It'll go out and do it, and then when you're done, all you have to do is tear it down. Very simple, very straightforward, uh, really easy. However, uh, if you're you know anything like like what type of background that I have, where I, I did a lot of system administration stuff, uh, that's great, uh, but it's really hard to to introduce that into uh, a lot of brownfield environments right off the bat. Uh, and you probably have, you're, you're kind of constricted in, in what you're dealing with and interacting with. So there's another type of infrastructure as code that's very helpful for those situations, and that's called configuration management. Uh, that allows you to take things that are already deployed and modify them through code uh, to get to still that end result. But then we have something that's kind of bullfish. And it kind of muddies the water, uh, but it's still still a very helpful 
helpful type of tool, uh, and, and it does really great stuff. So let's dive into the actual individual tools themselves here. So starting off with our, our provisioning options, I'll start with the one that's probably uh, most well known, and, and that's HashiCorp's Terraform. Uh, and, and so for each one of these, we'll be going through kind of the scripting language, point of control, uh, a little bit about the terminology, uh, and then some of the supported services. Now, one of the reasons why Terraform is, is so popular is, is one, it's open source. Uh, so anybody can download it from, from HashiCorp's website, uh, and it supports a immense amount of providers. Now, these providers are the way that Terraform talks to the different services. So it doesn't matter if it's Spotify, if it's Domino's, if it's AWS, if it's Azure, it's all these different things. Like they, it's pretty much one of those areas where if there's an API, you can probably talk to it. Uh, the scripting language that's under the cover is a uh, is the HashiCorp configuration language or HCL. Um, this is a dedicated language for it. However, if you look at it, it, it generally looks a little bit like JSON. So if, if you have an understanding of how to write JSON, you'll you'll you know, really get the formatting right off the bat. Uh, there are a couple different ways to control it. Again, there's the open source binary that you can run from anywhere, or there's hosted services like a Terraform cloud. Uh, with that, you have providers. That's the way that you talk to the different services. You have modules, which are just, you know, an easy conceptual way to, uh, you know, deploy large amounts of infrastructure using minimal amounts of code uh, that allows different organizations to, to kind of standardize on those things and, you know, makes it a little helpful uh, to go through the process. Configurations are the files where you describe the infrastructure that you want to manage, and then the resources are the infrastructure that you're managing. Now, the other big one is AWS CloudFormation. This is pretty much the, the one that's been around for the longest amount of time. Uh, and this is one of those that it only interacts with AWS. Uh, so that's one of the things that, that you should know right off the bat. Uh, it uses JSON or YAML, so you, you have a good mix there. Uh, it can be run locally, uh, although generally what happens is when you when you write your cloud formation, it gets run and it ends up in, an, in a bucket out in S3. With this, there are a couple different terms. So you have stacks uh, that are made up of templates that are made up of resources. Uh, so again, in this type of conf configuration, resources are going to be those things that you're managing. Templates allow you to easily deploy many different types of resources, uh, and stacks are just another kind of abstract of large sets of templates. Then we get into the Azure side of things, because that's that's generally the, the other big one, and, and especially at events like these, because uh, I, I certainly came, you know, was a was a first time attendee for a lot of the the PowerShell and, and Azure concepts. So uh, I do also want to talk about Azure uh, here. They've generally had ARM templates throughout the years. Uh, these are JSON based descriptions of the infrastructure that uh, that you want to use and consume within Azure uh, and only Azure. I should throw out. Uh, however, over time uh, and here recently, there has been the release of Bicep, um, and and this is a um, a DSL, which is basically just a, a custom language that's been created in order to, instead of defining your infrastructure using JSON files, uh, you have a little bit more opinionated way to do that through BICEP. With ARM templates uh, and the addition of BICEP, you have the capability of running this in a different couple different ways, either using the Azure CLI or even PowerShell uh, in order to manage your resources or using the hosted version of CloudShell. Uh, similarly to some of the others, you have templates. Those templates are made up of resources, and those resources are what you manage. All right, so let's move on to our configuration management options. Uh, here we have a very similar, uh, you know, kind of comparison area where we are, we're going to be talking about script language. We're going to be talking about the infrastructure that that uh, that's involved there what the point of control is or where some of these things run from, and then the terminology. So the first one that, that I probably was uh, starting off with is Chef. Uh, this is something that's mainly based in Ruby. Uh, you have several different infrastructure parts and pieces that go along with it. So basically you, you have your Chef workspace or Chef workstation that takes the configuration as you write it, pushes it to the Chef server, and then the Chef server configures the nodes uh, with whatever you need it to be. There's a central point of control there that is the chef server that's kind of the, the master. Uh, and then the script terminology is kind of fun because it, it plays right off of the, the company name there with recipes and cookbooks. 
Uh, so cookbooks are are your your description. Those are the things that uh, that roll up into the recipes, and those are what's pushed out to the nodes to actually apply different configurations. Then on the Puppet side, uh, we have a, a kind of Ruby situation, uh, another DSL uh, that that is customized for Puppet itself. When it comes to the infrastructure, you have your Puppet Master that syncs the configuration out to the nodes and, and applies the, the configurations as they've been written. Uh, here, Puppet has a Puppet Master uh, for its central point of control. You know, that's, that's the, the top level management uh, object. And with here, you have manifests and modules. Same thing as recipes and cookbooks, just a little bit different name. Then lastly, we have SaltStack. Uh, SaltStack was, was kind of a favorite of mine when it came around because I was, uh, I, I was really aligned more on the Python side. Uh, and underneath the covers, there's a whole lot of Python that's going on with SaltStack. However, when you're writing your configuration, it's all mainly written in YAML. And here you also have a salt master that pushes the configuration out to the minion, uh, which is known as the nodes. Uh, again, salt master is the central point of control, and the terminology is state and formula. Kind of works in the exact same way. Now, if you're still with me and you're following along, you probably are thinking that I missed one. Well, I didn't, because the one that you're probably thinking of really fits into the bullfish area. Uh, and that's really Red Hat's Ansible. Uh, and, and this is kind of one of those interesting areas where, where Ansible has, um, has a wide variety of capabilities where it can do lots of things. So it can provision things, it can apply configuration management to things. Uh, it, it's, it has a wide variety. So when it comes down to how we write our Ansible configurations, here we are using YAML. Uh, the infrastructure has a Ansible controller that applies the configuration. And the big thing for Ansible here is that it generally uses SSH or WinRM. There's no agents. There's nothing like that to install on these systems. Uh, it, it goes right over those, those two general protocols. The central point of control is going to be your Ansible tower. And then the script terminology are playbooks and roles. So that was a lot of information. And the one big thing that I, I hope you take away from this is that there are so many options and, you know, just be aware of what's going on in your environment and choose what best works best for you and that environment. There's going to be a lot of areas and a lot of situations where there might already be tools used out there. Um, and one of the, the really the core DevOps principles and concepts is, is you know, you know, just around the, the ability of sharing and, and kind of understanding and uh, you know, because I, I think a lot of the, the areas, if you, if you can get to a, a common set of tools, common set of languages, that's kind of one of those areas where you can share things throughout the organization so that everyone can get better. Uh, and you can bounce ideas off of a lot of better people um, or, or a lot of different people uh, without having it to conform to a particular vacuum or silo. And yes, I did quote myself, but it is a really good way uh, to segue out of our session uh, because I do want to thank you so much for, for tuning into this Automation Summit session. Uh, I had a great time uh, and please definitely hit me up if you have any questions, uh, comments, or, or even heckling for that matter. So thank you.